Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you all for coming out on a chilly uh, Chicago uh, day to uh, hear a little bit about Mother is a Verb. Um, so this is a book that draws on the history of North America uh, and of Britain, where I'm from, since the 17th century. Um, it's a book, therefore, that explores the worlds of uh, farm servants in New England, uh, Cree or Mohawk or Ojibwe women, enslaved people on South Carolina rice plantations, tenement dwellers in New York or in Liverpool, women's liberationists in San Francisco, or indeed the many generations of wet nurses, uh, such as those working mothers who worked just a few miles from here in the Sarah Morris Children's Hospital in the early 20th century, earning a living by nursing unwell babies alongside their own. So it's a book that sets out to give a history to mother as a verb. Now, I'd suggest that we're used to thinking mainly about mother as a noun, right? Mother as an occupation, mother as an identity, if you like. Or perhaps we're used to thinking of mother, about motherhood as an ideology, right? A sort of cultural institution that has been loaded down with moral and often very sentimental expectations. I was interested in thinking about what anthropologists call matrescence, that is to say the process of becoming a mother, very useful term from those anthropologists, and um, slowing the topic down in that way, I was especially interested in mother with an ing, right? So not mother as a noun, but rather of becoming, of mothering, mothering as a set of activities always being undertaken among other activities, of mother as a verb, of mother as a verb in a way that we might ask about. OK, well, all of that gets a little bit ahead of myself. Why a book at all about past experiences of pregnancy, of birth, of the encounter with an infant. As Alex uh, suggested, my day job is as a historian. Right? I read manuscripts and archives, I read history books, I read journal articles, I teach, I lecture, I write. Uh, but I've come to think about this book in particular as a creature of the night, and of sleepless nights in particular. The American poet Alicia Oestreicher described her nights as like a dirty, torn cloth. She was writing in 1976 during the women's liberation movement and she was thinking about the broken, interrupted nights of new motherhood. Not for her what the 18th century writer James Boswell described as deep sleep or absolute unconscious and unfeeling sleep. Not for Ostreicher the usual eight hour modern stretch. Now, a full eight hours Absolute and unconscious sleep, all of that sounded kind of amazing, delectable to me, but I was up in the middle of the night with a firstborn child. And really, this book came from exactly that experience, that experience in the dark, and from the earlier experiences of pregnancy and birth, and the later experiences of a second child. Caught in sleeplessness, holding an infant in the dark many, many nights, I wanted to know what it had been like before. Simply put, what did maternity feel like? The reproductive sex, chosen, unchosen, or maybe alternate means. The miscarrying. The sensations of pregnancy, right? Third month, eighth month. And then the pleasures of an infant, or the drear, the mundanity, the fatigue. Or, to put it in verbs, conceiving, carrying, miscarrying, birthing, and then, with a change of personnel, not all birth givers becoming mothers, and not all mothers having given birth, sleeping or not sleeping, holding, caring, using stuff, and so forth. Um, and in fact, to be honest, I was sort of astonished that I didn't already know the answer to that very simple question. Wasn't I a historian already? Wasn't I, in fact, a feminist historian? And in fact, Thinking about the, the theme of the Humanities Festival this year, really in part this is a story about the power of the archives, right? What do archives do? They gather the stories of institutions or of states or of nations. They don't privilege questions like, what is the history of maternity? If so then, how to write such a book? Well, I'm going to start by quoting a letter from 1878, which is actually the letter that is extracted up here in front of us today down at the bottom corner. Baby is stirring, so I must stop. There it is. Or, here's another example. 
the child will stay in my lap and interrupt me so much that I must stop. And really, that was the challenge, right? The letters, the memoirs to which historians like to turn when they're going to tell us about intimate life, they usually halt when they get to infants. The writing just stops altogether, both hands being needed to hold the baby. One letter I read very, very early on begins with, it began with one person's handwriting, and then it ended with another. She was called upstairs, the new letter writer added, or she would not have left this letter off so abruptly. Right? So in those sort of two centuries in which letter writing was a commonplace activity for the middle classes and the elites, it was an absolute convention that people with infants and small children were really lousy letter writers. Right? So even the most sort of privileged of our historical subjects, right? even those people who've who have left family papers in archives, even there, it is incredibly difficult to answer, to ask or to answer this very simple question of what did maternity feel like? So this was very frustrating to me in the early times, and it was frustrating until I decided to notice this problem in a different way. It came to seem to me that what these, ever, these letters really were about were about the experience of feeling continually interrupted, right? that it was in exactly in those moments of a letter ending abruptly, uh, ending um, unexpectedly, ending, and actually you can't see it in this case, with a, actually with an ink blot. There's an ink blot that's underneath all of this, uh, where you can, you can feel the haste you know, on the page. Uh, that those kinds of letters tell us about one constitutive feature of maternity, which is that state of feeling continually interrupted. They, in fact, suggested that I was going to need to write a whole chapter about the history of interruption. Much more generally, the letters also suggested the kind of evidence that this book might be built of, in fact. Broken anecdotes, right? stories that didn't quite land, but also short shards, any kind of tiny fragment of material that might suggest the ordinary experiences of people who were not writing stuff down. Not just the usual chatty letter writing middle classes then, but also just everybody else. So. The research for this book took me into all different corners of the past. Right? I'd given myself this, this big terrain of Britain and North America since the 17th century. So I went to those unusual personal writings where a person did pick up their pen again. The intimate 1880s diary of a white woman, for example, whose first baby was born in a DC boarding house. Mabel Todd carefully recorded who was sleeping where, when she got to have sex again. Right? Number 21, she writes, number 22. She documents the arrival of a poorly paid help at 6 a.m. in the morning. She gets a bit more sleep. Number 44 for me, she adds in the diary, about some early hours. Quite exhausted after the strain of so many hot days. Unable to get the baby to sleep itself, etc., etc. It's an incredibly unusual diary in this sort of lavish self-documentation of her intimate bodily life. Or, to give another of these very unusual examples, the 1949 memoir of a jazz-loving, red-headed Manhattanite who gave birth in a city hospital with the laughing gas administered just at that moment in which the baby was born, putting her out for 20 minutes. So in 1949, this is the very, very first um, first person published account of experiences of pregnancy and birth and being with an infant. She was completely ahead of her times. Right? We, the sort of maternal memoir that we can find when we walk into uh, our corner bookstore now that really is a creature of women's liberation movement and after, right? That moment when people said, no, these, these are topics. These are topics that we want to hear about. So she was incredibly ahead of the game, and I ended up tracking her down and writing to her in, uh, she lives in the West Village now, and I said, how is it that you came to write this one-off memoir that has no, had no precedent and that was not followed for several decades? And it turned out that her husband had been a literary agent, and she had some very canny publishers who asked her to write it. Right? So it took a sort of external valorization for her to even imagine that this is something that might be useful for public consumption. So apart from these very unusual examples, these unusual instances of self-disclosure, where else to look? All sorts of other materials, really, where you can read between the lines or off a surface. That is to say, sources that are not formally, in any sense, often about pregnancy or about infants, but that reveal something along the way. For example handwritten medical recipe books that were handed down from mothers to daughters, the embodied experiences of those women appearing in the placing of a poultice, the boiling of herbs. So in the Lily Library, um, in the Lily Rare Books Library here in the Midwest, for example, there are many, many uh, much-worn notebooks 
of exactly this kind, where you can unfold really a story of the cutting out of newspapers or almanacs, um, the references to which recipes worked and which didn't, or who gave you a recipe, who you used it for, the switch of handwriting between generations or between uh, daughters and aunts. How-to guides as well, from the 17th century all the way down to our present day, whether printed and bound in leather or mass-produced, say, whether read or unread, whether poured over and annotated or rejected. Midwifery manuals, and also oral histories with the lay midwives of the mid-20th century, that is to say the stories of the granny midwives, the black midwives of the American South, who cared for women both black and white, and whose stories were recorded by early advocates of uh, the natural childbirth movement of the late 20th century. 19th century slave narratives, interviews with formerly enslaved people that were taken down in the 1930s, or social scientists' reports on white tenant farmers in Appalachia, or government accounts about working women's lives in Kentucky or in Mississippi or in Michigan, social reformers' accounts of urban factory conditions. One of my favorite moments in the archives was, was arriving at a stray reference to a baby that had been suspended in an egg box above an urban factory worker's uh, workplace. Right? That's, this is how she managed to care for her infant. The letters that new mothers wrote to the US Children's Bureau in the early 20th century, or indeed to male experts like Dick Grant and Reed, who promoted so-called natural birth. So the kinds of letters that often poke at the gap between advice given and real experience. Early anthropology composed on native uh, reservations in tandem with native storytelling. And then also um, unfamiliar pieces of language that express experience, right? that express lost pieces of experience. So chin chucking or firking like a found flounder from the stray records of people's sexual pasts or um, being great bellied or round bellied, 17th and 18th century terms for late pregnancy, or more euphemistically in the 19th century, being in the family way, right? Or in a delicate condition. I mean, there's a, there's a whole history of shifted relationships to your body, right? Just in those comparisons. Nidgeting, the most wonderful verb, which means to gather your neighbors and friends up for a birth, right? You send, you send somebody out to nidget to bring the people in. Or alternately, scrouging about sharing a bed, right? So 1930s Appalachia, you know, move over, you're scrouging me, right? For moments of, of bed sharing. And then finally, in terms of trying to think about how one begins to ask this question of the archives, finally, objects which have the power to shape what we do. Maternal tools, if you like. So a rocking cradle, right? Which keeps a 17th century New England woman in the home, or conversely, a cradle board, he goes on the back, which lets her Iroquois contemporary walk and work outside. And in fact, Iroquois have a verb, especially for the act of bringing the cradle board up on your back. Right? There's a verb just dedicated to that everyday activity. Alternately, if we're thinking about objects, for middle class Victorians, who thought both of those sets of practices were completely uncivilized, right? Rocking cradles are out, cradle boards are certainly out. The stationary crib, right? immovable, and then all the ideas about sleep training that follow on from that object. There were surprises along the way in all this research. One surprise to me was the absolute typicality of what we might call dispersed mothering or other mothering, of mothering beyond the mother-baby diet that we first think of when we think of the figure of the mother. Looking out from Cincinnati in 1990, the distinguished black feminist Patricia Hill Collins smashed mothers and others into one verb. Right? She wanted to honor and to analyze the habits of care unrecognized by the American mainstream. White middle class mothers, Collins observed, assume that mothers take almost complete responsibility for childbearing, treating it as an occupation. She reported, by contrast, what black domestic worker Sarah Brooks had said about the help she got from a neighbor. She kept Vivian, Brooks said, and she didn't charge me nothing either. I reckon it's because we was all poor, and I guess they put their stuff in the place of the person that was helping. Now, I knew about these practices of other mothering, right, of mothering beyond that biological mother-baby diet. I knew about those practices of other mothering from teaching the history of slavery. Right? Enslaved people called aunt those adult women who nurtured children on their own. And Aunt Katie on a plantation near Fayetteville, 
North Carolina, and Aunt Comfort, another Aunt Katie in Maryland, and Aunt Mandy in Georgia, and Aunt Catherine in Kentucky. In My Bondage and My Freedom, one of the most famous like, slave narratives in the 19th century, Frederick Douglass pictures one of Aunt Katie's surreptitiously cutting children thick slices of bread in the plantation of the kitchen, <laughs> as well as sometimes favoring her own children, something which I made Douglass's own mother quite irate. <coughs> So these habits of communal mothering were handed down from West Africa and West Central Africa, where women had shared childbearing duties alongside agricultural tasks. Extended family groups in that setting had been more important than nuclear units. So what surprised me there was not to discover habits of other mothering among the African-American and British Caribbean communities with lineages back to West Africa, but also richly elsewhere, even technically so. Among the 17th century speakers of Miami in North America, for example, where the term for mother and maternal aunt are the same word. You know, just a wonderful indication of the, of the mixing of roles there. Or, alternately, among the multi-generational families of the Irish Catholic slums in Liverpool in the 1950s, where one woman might be called mother, and then, her, and then a new mother, her daughter, might be known as mum to differentiate them within a family group. So grandmothers, aunts, oldest daughters, neighbours, all these could be key routine figures of other mothering. It's a story we've lost in many ways. Another surprise of all of this research was the misogynistic origins and the sheer strangeness of the how-to guides, uh, of the medical prescriptions that people have had to negotiate at different times and places. So the origin of the how-to guides, as it turns out, is with the mid-18th century physician London's founding hospital. So these are philanthropist physicians, men like William Callier, who set up an institution to keep alive the abandoned infants of the poorest of the poor. Right? And along the way, they dreamed up hospital rules that they turned into general prescriptions for all mothers. The clue really is in the opening <coughs> sentence of Callier's 1757 essay on nursing. So nursing here meaning breastfeeding and taking care. Right? He writes, it is with great pleasure that I see at last the preservation of children become the care of men of sense. And it's also the promise of the guy that the BSA gives to impose reasonable methods of infant care. Now, we can imagine the essay upon nursing from a mother's point of view in thinking through the life of Margaret Collier, who was one of the wet nurses employed by the family hospital. In the winter of 1756-7, Margaret Collier, living in Chertsey, small town outside London had one infant of her own. So she's exactly at this moment of matrescence, right, of becoming a mother. For poor families like hers, money was especially tight when infants were small. So Margaret Collier adds the labor of wet nursing and takes in another infant of that January. Nursing an extra child in the family hospital, Charles name is Anne Spafford, could make a difference between remaining independent and ending up on the parish poor. Taking in two families, what Margaret does that much, makes her an even better balance of income and cost. They would have more or less replaced her usual um, earnings from agricultural work. So it's the hospital records that give us some sense of the comings and goings in this hospital. It's the hospital records that let us just pause for a moment over the ratio in that household. Right? Three infants, one household. Pretty intimidating ratio. So for Margaret Collier to nurse a foundling like Anne Stafford was to hold a baby in the hospital's standard first year uniform. Caps, plants and pulches, so what we would call in the United States diapers, shirts, linen sleeves, shoes, stockings, a blanket as an outer wrap of water. These clothes, I'm guessing, would have felt peculiarly lightweight for Margaret Collier's touch. The baby on her lap may have seemed strangely supple, oddly loose of body. And that was because in their publications and in their institution instructions, the hospital physicians were on a campaign against certain kinds of practices and against stiff rollers and swaddling bands in particular. Swaddling bands, they reckon, cause overheating and fits. The institution deliberately provided neither kind of clothing. No more swaddling, no more usual mode of keeping a baby quiet. So out went usual forms of comfort, the usual way in which you juggled carrying an infant with many other kinds of activities, and in came much less practical <coughs> notion 
maybe looking after an infant, a much more difficult enterprise. And indeed, if you read the how-to guides over time, if you read them from their 70th, 17th and 18th century origins all the way down to our present moment, what becomes apparent is that really they are reformist texts. Right? They are not interested in documenting what people do or what was agreed to be the best way of doing things. Rather, they want to change how things are done. Right? And they tend to want to change things with the highest possible stakes in mind. Right? So for William Cadogan and his uh, cohort of physicians, the stakes were keeping infants alive for the good of the British Empire. Right? We need more foot soldiers, was the argument embedded in the documents of the family hospital. For the generation of how-to guide writers uh, immediately after the American Revolution, it was raising children to be good citizens of the New Republic. Right? And so it goes on, all the way to a figure like Dr. Spock in the mid-20th century, who believed that changing forms of child rearing could bring world peace. So when I think about the kind of um, heat around <coughs> motherhood in American discussions today, I think this is the heritage, right? It's the sense of so much resting on the, soul, on the shoulders of mothers. Right? And these how-to guys have been a really amazing way of tracking extraordinarily high social and cultural expectations about what women must do and the consequences of those must do's. The other thing that's most striking if you read that body of material, as a body of material, is these strange extremes of advice get given over time. One of the most poignant examples of this, in fact, is the Truby King movement of the early 20th century, which suggested that you basically could not hug a baby too little. Put that baby down. Babies were best cared for, according to Truby King and his many, many followers, by putting them into bed in the fresh air and left alone. And actually, these are ideas that um, get generated in New, New Zealand in the late 19th, early 20th century, very temperate climate. You can imagine that they don't translate very well to places like Chicago or to London, right? Where um, you'll, walk, you'll see it in tenement buildings in which outdoor cribs poked out from windows, and babies were literally put in the outdoor crib. And the, and the recommendation is you leave it there, right? and then you go and make, you go and look after it over every several hours. Okay. With older infants, everything was supposed to go by the clock. Now, I'm glad to report that oral histories that were taken among these communities tended to suggest that while these very regimented ideas might be followed for a first child, they were often discarded or very heavily amended for a second. Uh, often they were overturned by new possibilities, new sets of ideas. Um, one of my very favourite moments of research for this book came with an archivist, uh, a man called Jim Green, who I worked with at the library company in my first book, which was sort of, you know, History of the American Revolution. So I got in touch with Jim, I knew that there was a, um, there was a collection, 200 strong of mother's manuals in the library company in Philadelphia, which had been donated to the archive by the editor historian Charles Rosenberg. And so I called him up, uh, and as I was telling him about the book I was working on, out popped this wonderful story. He said, oh yes, yeah, my mother's ideas, they changed in a twinkling of an eye with Dr. Spock. And you have to imagine this man as the archetype of archivist, like very quiet, very self-contained. The idea of talking about bodies with him was horrifying to me. I was very relieved I was on the phone with him. Uh, yes, yes, he said, my mother treated me completely or my older brother. My older brother was born under the old pre-spot spot regime, it's a very austere regime, but my babyhood was very different. And indeed, the 1946 edition of Spot that he was thinking of, his mother would have read, opens with the phrase, enjoy your baby, trust yourself. Right? So it's, it's an actually incredible moment in the history of mothers and infants in the 20th century, is this sudden licensing of pleasure in a child. So the ubiquity of other mothering, the misogynies, the strangenesses of how-to guides, these were some of the surprises in the research uh, that I undertook. But what I'd actually like to do now is to share a section of the book with you to give you some sense of its flavor um, and its mode. Um, so we're gonna pick up the story, as it were, in uh, chapter nine. The chapter is called Tears and Anecdotes. <coughs> so, the baby, Great welling cries fill the room. I hold the baby, I pat the baby's back, I pace us back and forth along the corridor by my bedroom. I soothe. The sound ricochets between the narrow walls and soaks into me. After the tactile quiet of pregnancy, there is so much noise. 
What exactly does an infant's cry sound like? The Dublin writer Anne Enright, charging herself earlier this century with writing a memoir about the puppet, takes no less than three pages, three whole pages, to articulate the sound of her, of her baby's cry. H A N A N G. H A N A N G. H A N A N G. 600 words, three full pages, until the cry comes to complete stop. Enright's challenge was to convert sound into text, to a set of letters on the page into black and white. Her dilemma was what an insistent cry often, but not always does, crowd everything else out. So what does an infant's cry sounded like? It's a banal cry, right? baby's cry. And sometimes, such as now, they cry a lot. But as it turns out, what an infant cry sounds like can't be separated from your historical environment. For a Californian aunt of 1900, a cry could sound like Scottish bagpipes with a long, thin smile. Or like a penny horn for a new mother in 1940s manner. Or like a red and green for the 1930s Ojibwa living on a reservation in their former hunting grounds. The green is a feisty, tough bird, about the size of a duck. The baby's pitiful, hard moan could sound just like it. So how a cry sounds depends on what you're used to hearing. Or how a cry sounds depends on ideas about babies. In 17th century England, a clear and loud newborn cry was a welcome sign that the baby was expelling the moisture of the womb. Vehement crying was thought to tax and infants delicate birds as a source of concern. Fifty odd years ago, in the town of Nottingham, many mothers thought that small babies cried simply when they needed something. But others thought the babies as both willful and cunning, and they distinguish between real crying and crafty crying, the term crafty. As one of remarks to a sociologist, they get very crafty, and if they know that you're going to keep running up and down the stairs, they do it all the more, and then they stop and they laugh at you. It's an incredibly poignant anecdote if you cross over it. You have someone being laughed at by their own infant. Or a cry can depend on ideas about pain. For much of the 18th and early 19th centuries, the consensus among doctors was that infants were exquisitely sensitive to pain. But this changed in the, in the 1870s, with many clinicians and scientists claiming that infants were almost completely insensible to pain. That idea was only fully debunked in the 1980s. Right? It's actually debunked by surgeons to point out that babies actually need a significant amount of honest anesthetics. How many infant caregivers really believe? Or a cry is more than just a sound. An irritating cry among 18th century letter writers, a spine-destroying cry in one early 20th century account. So crying can have a kind of bodily quality that leaps over the neat boundary between the carer and the baby, that pushes and pulls at the senses. A cry can be felt as more than just sound. It can be touched. Or a cry can be wor a sound worrisomely out of place. One English woman was brought before a church court in 1620, bringing a most unquiet child to the church to the great offence of the whole congregation. The vicar, it was reported, could not be heard for the offensive noise. An enslaved southern father kept a bottle of sweetened water in his shirt to keep warm to give the baby when it cried. Laura Clark recalled that when she was a slave child on an Alabama plantation, enslaved women regularly gave children sweets to keep us quiet. In a Louisville, Kentucky jail before the Civil War, Angie King walked her baby all night to keep a drunk white woman from carrying out the threat, the threat of bashing its brains out against the wall. King produced her free papers the next day to prove to her jailers that her husband had already bought her freedom and slavery. In the former quiet of the corridor by my room, the baby's cry is a refrain, a song without verses, a sermon without words. I listen, I interpret, I comfort, I place the sound of history. Thin bagpipes, a grieves moan, huh, man. The cry sounds raw, something innate spilling forth. But at the same time, the sound attests that what seems natural is only known through culture. Nature and culture can be different terms for the same thing. No sound can be heard, can be made sense of, outside our own historical circumstances outside the particularities and specificities of time and place and individual. I find this thought comforting 
a refusal to force universals. And I also wished to cry and stop. But we knew how to comfort him, returning to his own strength. My godmothers, Margaret and Betty, retired London nurses and fierce stalwarts of the 20th century medical profession. They say it does a baby good to cry, but I'm not sure I think that. And here's a separate section. This refers to uh, my partner, uh, who appears in the text as Kay. So, this evening, Kenny has the radio on and is getting things ready for the baby's bath. The white noise should prevent any conversation from waking the first one. Did you know, I say, leaning at the door frame, that when the British psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott was doing the first radio programs about mothering back in the 1940s, that listeners initially thought he was a woman? His high, reedy voice sounded female. Perhaps Winnicott's attitude about infant care helped, unlike so many male experts before and since. He clearly liked and trusted mothers. On the radio tonight, there's a discussion of a memoir by a Canadian trans man who nurses his own baby and works as a lactation consultant. Having a baby is such a moving target. Think of all the changes in our 21st century landscape, the new figures and styles. The trans man <coughs> in Winnipeg, queer families with an infant, new fathers staying at home, egalitarian mothering of babies among working parents. Or think of the rolling back of state services and the low value of assigned to caregiving under capitalism. Kay nods and agrees, preoccupied with washing the baby's torso. His New York accent bounces lightly against my toes, another half conversation in a stream of half conversations. I take the baby back in my arms. That's exactly what makes these different paths so compelling. A changing present calls for changing histories. Historical curiosity lets us fly, I am reckoning allows us to get free of ourselves, to adapt and to reimagine, to own more fully our own times, discerning in the contours what they are or what they might become. The past can burden us, or the past can release us. Just a few more. may sometimes appear universal, trans-historical if you like, but that these visceral experiences are richly various. Mothering is more plastic, more up for grabs than we might expect. The past is both more like us and more unlike us than we might expect. And I guess I think that that's what history can do for us sometimes. It can give us new words in the way that poetry does. It can give us unanticipated solidarities in the past. It can offer us radical alternatives. It can give us unexpected precisions, and it can give us distinctive understandings for ourselves in the present day. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So uh, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So just a couple notes. I'll uh, pass the mic around. Just ask your question, hand it back to me. If you could speak into the mic, that would be great. Um, and that's it. 
be right there. Thank you for your lecture. I would like for you to uh, tell me how you selected the cover of the book. Oh, the cover. So um, I published my book with Farah Strauss and Giroux, and I originally imagined it was going to have a very different cover to this. And in fact, I write about the image that I thought was going to be on this cover in the introduction. It's a, um, a huge canvas by the British artist Jenny Savile. And so what Savile did was she, um, she took that really familiar kind of Leonardo da Vinci, Madonna and Child figure, and she turned that figure into a modern figure. It's kinetic, she's looking out at us. That was for, forever, that was the front cover of my book. And in fact, the British edition of my book has the Savile on the front cover. So then one day I get an, an email from my editor and she writes me, she says, Sarah, sit down. This is what we think should be on the front cover of your book, but you have to see if you like it. And of course I'm trepidatious because I've been writing, been writing with this image in mind and then I clicked on it and there it was. And so it's an image that was done um, by a um, Spanish artist who um, my editor happened to know, who she had sent the book and who loved the book and who was moved to create that image. Um, and what, one of the things I love about it is that people see very different things in the figure. Right? So, for some figure so, so for some people looking at that, well, you tell me what you think you see, actually, before I say what, what, what I, I think I see. Yes. 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 I think that's I think that's a lovely reading, right? So some people see her drowning, and some people see her treading water. I guess you know I'm an optimist because I see her treading water. <laughs> um, and I think that's actually right about the body, right? That there's a there's someone who's deeply embodied. The body is slightly distorted by the water, right? And yet it's strong. Um, and then there's the hand, yeah, the hand that is gesturing out towards us. So I loved it. I mean, I was astonished. And then I, I came to really, to really love it. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Other comments or questions? I am most certainly familiar with the expression helicopter mother. <laughs> Isn't that, so there's a phrase, so there's, there's a phrase that I do not have a genealogy for. I mean, I couldn't tell you when it came into American discourse. Uh, I would say recently, I would say in the last 10 years, but I think we all know what it's supposed to capture, right? It's supposed to capture a figure that we don't like, and this is the privileged woman who is spending far too much of her time setting up her children's lives, right? Hovering over them. Um, you can probably hear from my definition that I don't like that kind of terminology. Um, and I don't like it because it sounds to me as if it's one part of one, a very long strain of commentary about mothers in this culture that is deeply misogynistic, deeply hostile to mothers. Um, so if you're a historian, you deal with often quite an ugly American past, right, in which mothers have been scolded for all sorts of different things, uh, often excluded from being good mothers for perfectly ordinary practices. Uh, and to my mind, even though this is a phrase that's attached to quite privileged women often, it's still part of that tradition of sneering. The girls are beginning to say about themselves. So women are self, you're saying women are self-identifying as helicopter mothers. <laughs> Ooh. So, there, so there I would want to say, bring to the stage a contemporary anthropologist or someone in media studies who could give us a great reading on where that phrase comes from and why not anyone would want to self-identify with it. Uh, yeah. You'll have to excuse my voice. Um, I was wondering if you talk about in your book uh, how the history of uh, sort of religious traditions mm -hmm. and attitudes towards mothering have influenced how mothering is experienced. So that's a great question, right? And that's a question that especially belongs to the world of prescription, I think, right? So if we go back to thinking about um, the routine ways in which 17th century New Englanders would have thought of this, they would have seen this as largely a godly act, right? So in that kind of a world, um, mothering is actually not women's highest calling, right? That, we don't have that sort of development until the 19th century, but in that sort of a world, a woman's role was to be a helpmeet, a mothering, 
as actually their childbearing was fundamental to her godliness. Right? So, so you go from a sort of 17th century world of um, help meet godliness, childbearing, to a 19th century world which is similarly saturated with uh, Christian references, but there the emphasis is on uh, mothering, not just being a wife, but mothering specifically, and on child rearing as the godly act. So the content, right, of the good Christian mother really shifts between that 17th century mode, for example, or a 19th century mode. And is there a cause for that? Yeah, so the people who would have told us about that, that story before would have been demographers, right, and they would have called it the fertility transition. Right, so the shift from enormous colonial families, right, seven or eight children on average in colonial families. Right, so those women are spending most of their adult lives pregnant or lactating. Two, um, a 19th century story in which the size of the family is maybe four at the beginning, all the way down to the sort of 2.2, right, of the later 20th century. Um, so demographers were really good at, at describing that transition. Um, and historians were puzzled about how to answer exactly your question. The best, the best answers that I have seen notice that the fertility tra transition happens in the United States and in France much earlier than in other industrialized nations. Right? So in these countries, it happens in the early 19th century. You go to somewhere like Britain, where I'm from, it's not to the later 19th century. So clearly industrialization, which would be one way of talking about why people have smaller families, don't need children f as farm workers. That's not an adequate explanation. The best explanation I have for this country in France is the ideals of the American Revolution. It's the notion of um, independence, autonomy, forward -looking, a forward-looking perspective, which uh, meant that the kinds of negotiations that men and women were having in the bedroom became very oriented around future plans, like a bourgeois approach to life, in other words. Right? So it didn't depend on technology. Um, it didn't depend on industrialization. I think it depended on a cultural shift in the early 19th century that, was, that embraced independence, that embraced greater autonomy, right? and in fact, the women claimed for themselves in this particular way. Right? So they diminished the number of children they had quite deliberately. I mean, it's not until the women's liberation movement that not having a child, like the choice, gets attached to this question. We're still talking about largely compulsory expectations uh, in those 17th and 19th centuries. Um, oftentimes, our thinking about mothering is really linked to what we think is optimal for children and our ideas about child development and yes. what children need from mothers. And I'm wondering how you address that question in the book or whether... So thinking is... about how um, shifting notions of child development have affected how people have mothered. So that's lovely. And... Um, one of the things that's very noticeable in the early how-to guides is that they're really focused on physical development, right? So it's all about um, the simplest forms of care, nursing, not rocking, right? The baby is a physical object, and it's only as a child grows, two or three years of age, you start to get a more concerned with like more pedagogic approach, right? That changes by the 19th century. So by the 19th century, there's this incredibly scrupulous sense that what you do from the very, very beginning will shape how a person turns out. Right? So the 19th century guides, they're thick, and they presume that you're concerned with an infant's moral development from the absolute get-go. So yes, I think our expectations about what is an infant, what is a child, and how we grow them, they're absolutely fundamental to... Um, how we think about what is mothering, what is good mothering in particular. Yeah, that's a great question. And yes? I, I just was going to build on that in terms of pretty much the recent understanding of early brain development and understanding how important those first few years are yeah. and the implication that that has for mothering and for the professionalization of other caregiving roles because of that and wondering um, if you see a precedent or you see this as just another swing in the pendulum or is this progress mm. moving forward? <laughs> progress, there's a word that makes historians come out with a, in hives, right? Um, mm. There's certainly a story here of professionalization, right? We could think of those early, early childcare manuals as a kind of professionalization that's, that's happening among male physicians, 
right? And we see women coming into fields uh, that are about childcare by the late 19th century. Um, I think there's also a story that runs alongside the one I've already shared with you about other mothering, right? Which is um, post-industrial arrival of the workplace and a massive expansion in commercial forms of what we would now call childcare, right? So there's a, there's a story about other mothering which is informal, which is kin-based, which is neighbor-based. And then there's a separate story about all of those professions that grow up around childcare outside the home. Right? and then their regulation by the state. And that proliferates. Right? We, I mean, we probably all named 12 different occupations that concern in some way infants. Right? Um, that would have been unimaginable in a 17th century world or a, or a 19th century world, right? where expertise would have been in the hands of uh, your mother, your grandmother, your aunt, your neighbors, right? or the midwife. Right? So really different figures of expertise there, I think. Do your materials tell you anything at all, if, or if there were, a tension between your role as a wife and your role as a mother, if that plays out at this early stage? Um, and perhaps in the archival material, if there were any information about what husbands thought of their wives who are now becoming mothers. Um, and I was thinking term, also in terms of sort of mothering, we talk about mothering children, um, but one can mother other people, perhaps one's husbands or partners, yes. um, and so I was curious yes. about that tension, if there were that tension, if that's yeah. what your material said, anything. Um, and second, I was curious about your archivist friend, who thanks to Dr. Spock, yes. his mother enjoyed him. I was wondering whether his memories of childhood are markedly different from his older brother's memories mm. of childhood, and how they might, I mean, I know there are many way, things yes. that go into how a child feels mm -hmm. about their parents, but I was wondering if, if he said anything about his older brother's um, feelings about his mother. So, so this is James Green at the Library Company, and uh, he told a story, it's a story about um, his brothers and his relative memories of childhood, but also of their relative intimacies with their mother. So for him, it really was a story about his relationship with his mother and how much closer that relationship was by his reckoning because of these more intimate early years. And I have, I do think that story is repeated again and again in the oral history sources that I have read. That to the extent that we can know what the effect was of that particular child rearing moment that was so austere, that was so by the clock, that was so sort of anti-tactile, if you like, um, it's sort of what we might expect here in 2019, where I think we tend away from that, right? Um, and so there are quite trenchant commentaries uh, where women reject those earlier prescriptions or resent them. Or there are commentaries where women defend, sort of are very defensive about how, having followed those prescriptions. So these are stories that get told and retold in families, aren't they? I mean, there, there, are, there are biographical experiences and then they turn into memories and they turn into family stories. Your other question is about, um, what about husbands and wives? <laughs> and um, so several things. Number one, one of the questions I was asking is, all right, so if we're going to put aside ideology and actually think about real experience, um, what was actually happening in people's houses? And surely men had a larger role than we might think, right? Surely I will find fathers doing what we conventionally think of as maternal labor. And on that question, the jury is really out. You know, the, the very first um, material I found that actually visually represents a father tending an infant is from Amsterdam in the late 17th century, and it's an engraving, and uh, the wife or mother is in bed with her eyes shut. She's not looking great. Maybe she's unwell, and he's pacing with this infant, and he's holding this infant so awkwardly that it's hard not to think that this is an engraving that's about that, that's about the exceptionalism of that act rather than its typicality. Right? Um, I have really wonderful archival material from the 20th century in which women complain about the fact that they're always the ones getting up and the husbands don't get up. And that there are, it's pretty clear to me that in you know, the kind of working class community that I come from, men did not get up and look after the kids. That would have, that would have been outside the bounds of masculinity. And, and in fact, if you look at those households where women died or mothers were absent, those are families that break up, right? There's no social sense that a father is 
able to look after his own children. He's going to send them to, to female relatives. He's going to marry again as quickly as he can, maybe. That's probably the best case scenario. He's going to try and employ a housekeeper, but a working man's wage in the early 20th century is not going to actually support a housekeeper. So that tells us one set of the, of the dynamics. And I have almost nothing about um, the real question that you want to ask, which is how husbands and wives have navigated the arrival of infants. There's just an incredible dearth of evidence on that. Um, the only exception I have is the, the 1880s guy that I mentioned, this woman who was a very literary man in the boarding house, right, who's carefully documented the second time. And um, she's a very young woman. She positions herself like a child. I mean, she's really internalized that 19th century sense that there were men and there were women and children. And she's clearly very invested in her own childlikeness in a way that's very creepy. Um, and that is a story about clawing back a marriage as more important to her than any other role. So it's all about rediscovering the sexuality of her husband and uh, the infant as a real distraction from that, from that. So you can see there where the comparative investments are. But oh, that's really hard. Archivally, that's a really hard question to get to. Yeah. I was curious when you were thinking and then writing this book, what sort of audience you envisioned. And my understanding is that there is, um, this is just a little statistic I think I read a few years ago about journals that are in the gender and women's studies space. For every 10 articles published, only one is really about motherhood. I don't know if that's true. Yes, can be supported. But so you're asking about audience and you're also asking about the status of this as a topic. So those are actually really different questions. When I was writing this book, um, I actually thought this was kind of a privilege of tenure. This was going to be me doing a project because I wanted to, rather than for my colleagues on my corridor at the Canadian University. Um, I wanted to write a book that you would want to give your best friend when they told you they were pregnant. That's the kind of to write. I wanted to write a book that I wanted to read. And I really couldn't believe I didn't already know this history. And I, uh, was saturated with the term memoir and found it cathartic and fascinating and I wanted to write a book that would bring memoir and history to one place and give us a way of understanding the past differently. So that's the book I set out to write, that is why I published with the trade press and, I, and that's why I've got a license to experiment in all sorts of ways with the form of the book, including my own voices and story. The other question about where mater maternity fits uh, in academic discourse, I would say it's really awkwardly. I would say the mainstream Historiography is still astonishingly dominated by um, history writing that does not care about gender, very simply put. And um, fertility is a tricky subject for feminist historians. It has been for a very long time, right? The concern is that if you turn <coughs> onto those experiences or topics which are most sequestered women from real events, big events, you will replicate their exclusion. And this is a very famous critique made in a 1980s by James Scott, which just said, we cannot have a women's history that reifies, that repeats women's exclusion from what really matters for history with a capital H. And really, it's, it's not a surprise to me that it took someone of a later generation than Scott who has grown up among women's, women's historians, like someone like me, where the door has been opened to feminist history, to then walk through it and say, actually, I'm going to turn back to what would have been a very conservative topic. And insist that it's really valuable for feminists to confront it. So I think maternity studies or the history of maternity is in a very limited place in the academy. It makes sense to me that I wanted to write a trade book for that reason. It's much easier for me to imagine this conversation than a conversation that's on the story. So this is much more exciting. <laughs> so we have time for one more question. <laughs> 
which is, you know, it's a cool thing to write about K or my children M and B, as I do in this book, because I don't feel like I'm uh, betraying any confidences. I don't feel like I'm betraying their privacy. It's like maybe. Um, it's a really different prospect to ask the kinds of questions and make the kind of explorations I've made here for older children. I don't think I can write my children <coughs> Thank you so much. And don't forget that uh, we'll leave the book sending in the back of the room. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. The book signing line will start back here. Thank you for joining us. We're so glad to have you with us.